Good afternoon. My name is Megan Highfield, and I'm the Assistant Director of Special Services for the MSD of Wayne Township. Welcome to the Breaking Down Barriers Fall Symposium presented by the Indiana Council for Exceptional Children. Thank you for joining us today. This session will be recorded to share out after the conclusion of the symposium. We are hopeful that you're going to walk away with valuable information that will help you in your role supporting staff, students, and the entire school community. Before we begin, I just want to make you aware that questions should be entered in the Q&A box. At the end of the session, we'll allow the presenter to answer as many questions as time will permit. Sessions will be recorded and shared after the symposium has ended, so keep an eye out for an email from the Indiana Council for Exceptional Children. At the end of today's symposium, you will be asked to complete an exit ticket. We invite you to provide feedback, which is a valuable gift to us. Now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Linda Watkins. Dr. Watkins began her career as an elementary special education teacher in Avon schools before shifting into district leadership as the special education coordinator for Franklin Township and RISE Special Services. She then had the opportunity to serve as director of exceptional learners at the MSD of Decatur Township, overseeing special education section 504 English learners, and high ability programs for the district. From there, she transitioned to Indianapolis Public Schools in the roles of Executive Director of Alternative Options and Executive Director of Special Education on the school supervision and academic teams, respectively. Currently, she's in her second year as the Director of Special Services at the MSD of Wayne Township, where she supports special education, Section 504, and social emotional learning. Dr. Watkins was recognized as a Butler University College of Education Distinguished Alumna in 2012 for her work in the field. She has also served as a guest panelist at the University of Indianapolis iLead program and the Indiana University Director of Exceptional Needs program, presented as a guest lecturer, lecturer at the Butler University EPPSP and taught courses at the University of Indianapolis and Marion University as an adjunct professor. She's an active member of ICASE and is the current governmental affairs representative for the Central Roundtable. Dr. Watkins earned her Bachelor of Science in Elementary Education from Butler University, her Master of Arts in Educational Leadership from the University of Indianapolis, her Director of Exceptional Needs License from Indiana University, and her Doctor of Education in Educational Administration and Supervision from Ball State University. When not at work, Dr. Watkins is a busy mom of two boys, Hayden and Trace. She loves Butler basketball, fitness, gardening, and strong coffee. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Watkins. Thank you, Megan. And thanks everybody for being here today. I'm really excited to get the opportunity to talk with all of you. Um, and so this first slide pretty much summarizes um, my bio, but gives you some pictures to go along with. Um, the important thing with all the uh, colleges here in Indiana is that I'm a diehard Butler basketball fan, so appreciate my work everywhere, but um, always bleed blue uh, for Butler. Um, those are my two sweet boys. Hayden is nine, Trace is five, and so now they're both school age, um, and they keep me very busy and also just grounded in my why for doing this work. Um, I have spent my entire career in special education. Um, that's what I always wanted to do is be a special education teacher when I grew up, and so I've absolutely loved the opportunities that I've had around the area. And I will tell you that special education administration, they're like dog years. So this is my 13th year. I'm still standing, still love it. I'm still excited to come to work every day. Um, and I'm very fortunate to be a part of the team here at Wayne Township. Um, what you do not see on this slide is where I attended law school because I did not go to law school. Um, this is not legal advice. I am not an attorney, so just want to be clear. Um, what I'm going to share with you today is truly just things, mistakes I've made, mistakes I've helped other people fix, things that have happened over the course of my career that I sometimes think, man, if I had just known that or, you know, every single time something happens, we try to find the silver lining in the lesson that's embedded so we can get better and know for next time. So hopefully some of the things that I share today will be helpful to you. 
So now I want to hear a little bit more about who is in the session. So we have a little interactive portion first. Um, this is a Slido. So what I would like for you to do, quick, if you have your phone, grab it and scan the QR code and you can answer um, your first question, which is just what is your current role? So I know who I'm talking to. Um, you can, if you don't have your phone to do a QR code, you can go to slido.com and then it'll ask you for those digits that are on the slide, the 4887189. So I'll give you just a moment to answer that poll and then that should show up for us. Great. We've got some coordinators, essential skills, assistant director, wide variety. Awesome, lots of special ed teachers. Very good, SLP. Great. Give you about 10 more seconds and then we'll go on to the next one. So this is good. We have a wide variety, it looks like, of levels and supports. Awesome, thank you. Two more people are typing. One. <laughs> Great. Okay, let's go on to the next one. How many years have you been in education? Scan that QR code. Okay, so again, we've got a wide variety. A lot of people with a lot of experience on here. So at the end, you can jump on and tell your war stories too of all the things you learned because I'm sure we all have different things we could share. Very good. Just a few more seconds to wrap that up. Okay. Last question, where do you currently serve? So what district or school are you in? What organization? Again, wide variety, you love to see that. I think we have every part of the state represented. That's great. Awesome, thanks for sharing that, guys. Okay, so the format that I'm going to follow today, I tried to come up with 18 different lessons um, that I felt like were the biggest ones that I wanted to share. And so I'm, I numbered them. And then after I'm just going to share what the lesson was and how I came to know it um, based on experience. So um, again, just thinking through like, man, sometimes things really seem really clear after they've occurred, but you know, when something happens and you just haven't experienced it before, it's always a learning moment. And so I think it's really important to just keep that open mind in our work. Um, and that's the way that we are able to sustain over the long term is just always be learners with everything that happens. Okay, so we're going to dive right in because there's a lot to cover. My first lesson, number one, is memorize your timelines. And so when we talk about timelines, um, you know, there are different types of days outlined in Article 7, and it specifies what those days are. And so I can't tell you how many times I've seen errors with teachers not realizing uh, what kind of days they're talking about. So, for example, you have 10 school days to hold a move-in case conference. You have 10 days, school days to hold a conference after a parent has requested. But after you hold a case conference and you have to finalize the IEP, you have 10 business days to get that IEP finalized and in the hands of the parents or guardians. Um, so uh, something that happened that really brought this um, to the forefront for me was a time when I was working at a district that had a two week extended break. And right before the break, there was a case conference held. Um, and it was a spring break, so there were no holidays. So we had all business days on the spring break and the teacher just decided to go ahead and leave for his trip and didn't finalize anything, didn't get anything written up. Um, and that meeting didn't go very well. It was just like one or two days before the end of, of um, that time of that week. And so um, the parent ended up filing for due process. Um, didn't have a finalized IEP, didn't have anything in place. Um, it was a giant mess. And 
we were also then out of compliance because we were past the timeline to even get the IEP to the parents. And it was just a whole thing. And so I say that to say, watch those business days in particular. And remember that that does not mean school days because we kind of operate on our own calendar and we're in our own world sometimes in schools. Um, but that's just not what this means in this particular part. Um, also, the other thing that I would say is being aware that you can use your days. Um, and should use them at times, especially on contentious cases. And so if you have a really tough IEP and you want to make sure that everything is in place and that everything is, you know, exactly the way it should be. Um, sometimes, you know, I know if it's a meeting that I've had to attend, um, I may say, like, I don't want this finalized until I've had a chance to go through it. Um, sometimes, you know, we want to put several different eyes on it to make sure that we're not missing anything. It is totally appropriate and best practice to take your time in finalizing and use those 10 business days. Um, I know parents may, I just had this happen, a parent sort of told us when, um, when, when she expected the document to be done. And so I just kind of lovingly explained that that's not really the way it works and that these are the number of days we have. We typically turn it over faster, um, but this is the timeline that we follow. So um, it's better because if anything happens after, you're standing on that last IEP. So you wanna be really confident that what you have in there is what you intended and that it's been proofread and, and looked over thoroughly. The next lesson that I would say is to remember to distribute your paperwork every time. So um, every single time that you hold a case conference, you need to remember um, that the paperwork has to go out to all of the team members involved with that student. Anybody with an educational interest needs to have access to the most current paperwork. Um, and again, this is um, something that I learned from a complaint that was filed uh, that we had a, a pretty difficult case and um, had conferenced several times over and over and over. And um, I think that the team just got behind and the teacher of record did not get the most current versions out. Well, what happened is in those meetings that were pretty contentious, they were updating the behavior intervention plan. And so <clears throat> the current plan wasn't being redistributed to everybody on the team, which guess what that means? We then weren't implementing that current plan correctly or with fidelity because they didn't have the copy of it or didn't have the updated information. And so then we were denying FAPE and then you can imagine where that went. So we just wanna be sure every time, we're really good at doing it. I think at the beginning of the school year, maybe second semester, especially at secondary level or quarter or whenever kids <clears throat> are picking up different classes, but we just want to be sure that if there's any sort of a revision that's occurring, that that new paperwork goes. Um, and also healthcare plans. I mentioned the behavior intervention plan, but anything that's just like a, um, even if it's not directly part of the IEP, but something that gets updated and needs to be dispersed, you just want to think through like, okay, this is done. This is updated. Great. But who needs to have it and who needs to have access to it? Um, we had a situation last year where a student had a seizure and um, the healthcare plan wasn't accessible. And so, you know, we realized at that point, like there was a weak point where we needed to be sure that that was being distributed um, because the people who happened to be on the scene for um, responding to the seizure didn't have a current healthcare plan right there. So you just want to, you hope those situations don't happen, but if they do, who needs the information and do they have it? Don't forget transportation. Um, you know, there might be something that applies on the bus that needs to be distributed. Paraprofessionals um, sometimes are left off or even related arts teachers, you know, but that IEP should follow that kid all the time. So just think through the whole team. The third one is to be consistent with your communication. So um, communication we know is always important in any relationship and with our families, um, there's um, absolutely no difference there. So we want to think about how um, we're communicating well and stick with the plan that we put in place. And so um, you don't want to overcommit yourself in an IEP. I've seen this before where teachers are really, you know, anxious to, to do the right thing and, you know, help out and, and be super communicative. And I appreciate that so much, but you don't want to put it so detailed that you can't live with it past a week and then you're exhausted because it's so much communication, but just something that makes sense, that's reasonable, that's going to keep everybody on the same page, um, you know, that you can stick with and, and feel good about. I always talk about the communication section of Indian IEP. Um, it's critical. It's so helpful. Um, whenever you're making a call, you know, just sticking it in that communication log because then it's part of the student record. I know for me at the district level, it's great because when I get a call from a parent, I can go in there and I can see what the conversations are that have been occurring. 
Um, you know, then also when I call, I put my call in as well so that the teacher record can see like, hey, this person called, I'm going to notify them too, but then that's part of the record that they know that they have called central office and had some concerns. It just keeps us all on the same page and, and documents the call that it happened. And that can be to our advantage when we're trying to piece together maybe what went wrong. Sometimes a complaint has come in and we're trying to understand the situation. It's really nice if we can go back and see a paper trail of you know, the communication that's happened. If I get a parent that's like, this teacher never communicates, they never call me, they never do this. And I can say like, well, they've called you eight times in the last two weeks, you know, um, or whatever the case may be. Uh, that way it's, it's visible and, and keeps us all honest. Um, we also want to think about just response time in general. So um, rule of thumb, I would say is 24 to 48 hours max. Um, sometimes you don't have the answer that you need in that amount of time, but it's really helpful to at least give a touch point and say, hey, I'm not sure about this yet, but I'm working on it. Just want you to know I got your call or I got your um, email, you know, but we always want to prioritize the parents. Um, they're contacting us for a reason. And so I know everybody is busy and we get tons of communication, but parents should always come to the top of your list um, to communicate with as quickly as you possibly can. Um, and then also though, you do still need to have boundaries. Um, there have been times I've dealt with parents and I'm sure others have as well, who will take absolutely everything that you will give. And so you do need to be, respond within 24 to 48 hours. You do not need to respond in five minutes um, every time. And, and also sometimes it's good practice to just sit for a minute, especially if you're not sure that your response is going to be the best. You know, sometimes I get an email that really makes me pretty fired up and I need to sit in it for a second and think about how I really want to respond to that before reaching back out. But just setting those boundaries, um, if it's, you know, at night, over the weekend, you're with your family, it is totally okay to wait and not feel like you have to immediately respond all the time because certain ones like will just continue to expect that from you all the time and you'll run yourself ragged. So remember your self-care when you're thinking about your communication boundaries. Lesson four, there are always potentially harmful effects. So um, this is a section on the IEP. Um, and I just think that this section is handled differently by different people. Um, but the thing that we need to remember is when we're talking about what are the potentially harmful effects in a case conference, there is always going to be some sort of a downside that we need to consider. So there's no perfect placement for a student. We have where we land that we believe is fake for a student. That doesn't mean that it's without areas of concern or things that we wish would be incorporated or things that we're giving up. And so in this section, we really want to name those. Like we really wanna walk through and think about, you know, what it is that um, we need to discuss. Like what, what is the downside? What should parents be prepared for? This is not the section where um, you want to just like say, well, this could happen, but we believe, and then you reaffirm why you they should choose the option that you want. Um, we hope that we get them there through the other parts of the IEP, but this is specifically about like what's wrong with this option. And so, or what's potentially harmful. It's not necessarily wrong. That's probably too strong of a word, but the other thing too is this is preparing parents so i'm thinking like i'm a mom i would want to know like what what do i need to, to understand about this place if it's a placement change maybe they're switching buildings then they need to hear about what what are they going to be missing out on like what if you're considering um, we have a separate day school in wayne you know that's a huge jump like we have a ton of potentially harmful effects that we're going to run through before we're ever going to talk about transitioning a student over because they need to be informed so that they feel comfortable later you know and then if these things come up and it's something that they don't feel good about they haven't had the opportunity to have the knowledge on the front end so just don't be afraid sometimes as educators we just want to be positive and we want to share the good um, and then we feel like, oh, we shouldn't be negative about this place and they might not agree. But that really is the intent of this portion of the IEP is to say the downside. So don't be afraid to do it. The next one, lesson five, is bring your data. So set up that progress monitoring from the start. So um, on this one, I think when we're looking at our annual goals, sometimes I see goals written and I just think how in the world are we going to monitor that how are we actually going to collect data on whether or not a student is doing that and so you know we need to, to use that lens and think that through before committing to having that goal in an IEP so really have you know what the plan is going to be for how the data is collected 
because once we start, you know, with the IEP in place, then we're sort of dependent on the data we were able to collect to help us make our next move, whether that be something for academics, something behaviorally that we're watching with a student. It's really hard to make recommendations if we um, don't have strong data gathered to support what we are doing or what we think that we should do. So um, I have seen this play out at the conference table in a couple different ways. So um, I can think of a, a grandmother that, that wanted her child to be from, this child was doing great academically, fully included in um, the grade level in general education. Um, the school really had very few concerns but the grandma felt that the student needed to be moved to a full-time self-contained life skills placement. And it was completely inappropriate in our opinion. And so we were able to then sort of put on a clinic and lay out, here's all the academic data that's being collected. This is the growth that we've seen over the last year. Um, you know, and then we felt really comfortable saying like, this is our offer of faith, general education with these supports you know, in that setting, um, and, and this is this is where we're going to stand. We, we weren't going to agree to that self-contained placement for the student because it, it would have been so harmful to um, that particular student, but also the data just didn't support it. So that was a great example of where, you know, the, the grandma really didn't have much to say. We were kind about it, but like, this is, this is what we're offering. Um, and then also, I would say the same thing applies. Sometimes we've had requests for residential placements um, and we really don't have near the level of behavior at school, maybe than what they're experiencing at home. And so we're able to show like the students doing really well in this setting. Um, you know, this is where we feel confident that we wanna continue to serve the student um, based on the behavioral data that we're collecting, we're seeing growth. Um, and if we have that, if we're able to keep that progress monitoring over time, it really can be helpful when we come back to the table. So, but I just, I have found that if that's not planned for from the very beginning, it's much harder to figure out on the back end. Okay, so lesson six, it's usually the procedural errors that get us. Um, so when we get um, any sort of a complaint or a due process filed, um, I don't know, I saw there were a couple of directors on the call. Often it's just those little tiny things that we end up settling because we made some mistakes or there's just some things there. I call it the low hanging fruit, um, things that we missed that we just shouldn't have, you know, the easy stuff that we should get every single time. So just be mindful of that. Um, making sure that we're generating notices before we hold case conferences, making sure that those progress reports we were just talking about, the quarterly ones that we do in Indiana IEP, that those are done and they're on time and they're in there. Um, you know, the other thing that seems very simple too, but if we write it, we have to do it. So thinking about, um, you know, our behavior intervention plans, the steps that we have, um, the accommodations we have, or, you know, what we're providing as far as provisions and the services, the different staff that are supporting. Um, it's great. We can come up with the best plan ever and write it in the IEP, but if we don't actually do it, then we're denying faith because that has become part of that student's IEP. So we have to actually implement and do what we said we were going to do. Um, another thing that is a huge pet peeve of mine, if I'm being honest, is just checking the IEP for typos, grammatical errors, incorrect names. Please, please, please do not put another student's name in the IEP. Um, you know, just remembering that that finished document is a legal binding document representing your school district. And so you want to be you know, very careful that it is a professional document, that it represents you and your school district well, um, because should we have anything come up later, like we're gonna stand on that last IEP. So just make sure that it's something that you are proud of that is reflective of the work that is being done. Lesson seven, keep accurate service logs. So again, um, whatever services you're providing, you just wanna be able to um, show that documentation, you know, um, complaints seem to be the theme here, but I've also had complaints about missed services and some of them were due to COVID um, that I, you know, supported and, and handled. And, um, you know, there were a couple cases where the allegation was that services weren't provided, but then um, the service providers or teachers were able to come back and say, like, here are our logs, like, these are the times that these services were provided. 
And then guess what? The complaint, that's not a finding. Like if there's evidence that the services actually were provided, then the state is not going to issue a finding on that. So however, if there's no evidence that it occurred and, um, you know, we actually to the contrary, are showing that we're not providing what we were supposed to have provided, then we could be on the hook for some sort of compensatory. Um, we've got to have evidence of what happened. Um, the thing about anything with service logs is that you, you need it to be efficient and you need it to work for you. This doesn't have to be fancy. Um, I've seen some many different ways to collect this information. Um, and I've seen some teachers try to come up with like the prettiest, fanciest, nicest version and it's lovely um the first three days but it's not sustainable so whatever works for you um, but just know that if you know your director comes knocking on your door and you need to produce service logs you need to be able to have evidence of what you have actually provided to your students and then it makes everything so much easier okay lesson eight i say this all the time but there is no iep jail so there are times um, we, we all make mistakes. Mistakes are going to happen. Um, and as long as you're not being negligent in some way or doing something illegal, um, we can usually fix it. And so the joke in our office is I just always say, like, just tell me how much I owe, you know. But if there are issues, usually we've, if we've made a mistake, um, it's probably going to be some sort of compensatory service. We might have to do a technical assistance PD. Um, there's, there's going to be something like if we have a finding, we did something wrong, we need to make it better, we need to fix it, we need to improve, we need to not do it the next time. But as long as you are putting forth a good faith effort, and you're putting us in the best position possible, it is okay. There are going to be things that happen that are beyond our control. And I see this, especially with our younger teachers, as those of you that are earlier in your careers, um, you know, things are going to happen. Um, and sometimes it's, it's a non-issue. And, and most of the time when things happen, you know, we are able to fix it. A lot of parents are super understanding. They get it. Like they're going to work with us. We're going to communicate. It's fine. Sometimes it's not fine. And if you have been in a situation that sort of escalated and got to a higher level, um, those aren't fun, you know, I'll just be honest, they're not. Um, but we can usually fix it, just be upfront with what's happening and communicate, and that's the best path. Okay, lesson nine, fully revisit the entire IEP at least annually. Um, so at least at the annual conference, we need to have everything like touched throughout the IEP. So we wanna be up updated. We wanna make sure that we've pulled out anything that no longer applies that it's clean, it has the most current information throughout the document. Um, if you are seeing like the same exact goals and services year over year over year, like we're, it's probably not a super effective IEP. You need to, if a kid really hasn't made growth to the point of needing different goals, um, then we need to change something in that IEP. It shouldn't just sit there stagnant um, I had a due process filed and I'll never forget that the attorney laid three IEPs right next to each other and showed us how through the sections there were like maybe one to two words different and that's it. So this student had essentially had the exact same everything with the same teacher of record for three years in a row, looked like it had just all been copied over um, and so, you know, we were in no position to argue anything at that point. Like we just had to settle and, and move on um, and just try to get out with the least amount of expense to the district. So just making sure that you're really thoughtful and utilizing that annual to, to go through each portion. Um, this matters for kids and like reading a an IEP cover to cover should give a full picture of where a student is functioning. Um, and what they're, you know, what they've accomplished over the last year and what we hope for them to accomplish in the next year. And so we want to keep moving the bar for them and keep them progressing. Um, and so we won't know that if we're not truly looking at each section annually. Okay, so for number 10, um, take the time to staff difficult conferences ahead of time to avoid surprises. Um, 
if you know me and you know, if you've sat in a staffing with me, I always say, I do not like to be surprised at my conference table. So um, it's usually not a good thing to be surprised. Uh, it's much preferred to have those internal discussions ahead of time. Um, it just, we want the school to look unified and to be on the same page. It makes for a smoother conference. Um, you do not want your own team to be arguing, not that you can't have discussion in the meeting, but when people are clearly in disagreement, that's a very uncomfortable conference. And it's challenging for the parent too, I think, to navigate and know what's happening. Um, and so we need to be clear on what it is that we have available to offer. And then too, if there's something that's probably going to be put out there that we disagree with and we're not able to offer, um, everyone needs to be on the same page with that. Um, it's really helpful, especially if it's going to be probably a tough, contentious meeting uh, to know exactly who's the par, a note taker, who's, who's talking about the tough issues. So if there's one or two particular things that you know are going to be challenging to bring up and cover, you know, having a plan, um, who's going to say what? Like I even walk through it with the team if I'm able to, like um, who's going to present, who has the best relationship with the parent, what makes the most sense. Um, as far as delivery, that sort of thing. Another thing I will often do is develop an agenda. So if there's a lot to cover, and I know it's a pretty hefty list that we need to cover, um, like really organizing it out in an agenda and prioritizing the order of topics. So like what we need to cover and then what makes sense, the flow of the meeting. So thinking about just, just the planning, that front-loaded work to try to have the best possible meeting set up. Um, and then I just want to say, like, in general, sometimes I've gotten pushback, like, well, you can't do all this ahead of the meeting, you're predetermining. Absolutely not. You're preparing so that the meeting is productive and efficient. So no decisions are being made until you're sitting at the case conference. Everything in the IEP drafts is draft all over it, because that's what it is. You haven't finalized anything. You still need to be open to discussion and, you know, what um, you're hearing from the parent, but I... I think it behooves everyone to be well prepared, um, especially if you know that there can be some challenging topics covered. Um, and then the other piece with the agenda and just the meeting in general is I really suggest gathering parent input ahead of time. Like if there are particular areas that they want to have covered because you don't wanna just have a full agenda of school items and then leave no time for the parent items or you know, not get, or also it helps you make sure that you're prepared to talk about what the parent wants to talk about. So there might be some information you need to gather as a school team or that the party needs to be um, prepared to present. And so you want as much as possible to have that before the meeting. And then it just helps um, to, it just creates a professional environment, a professional meeting, it shows the parent that you've put in the effort and that you really want to have a productive, efficient meeting. Okay, so 11, um, put it in the case conference notes or it didn't happen. Um, okay, so I always, I'm the worst note taker. Like I fully admit to you, I'm the worst note taker. When I, especially if I'm the part of the case conference and I'm really trying to think through um, and like the agenda we just talked about, if I'm really trying to facilitate a meeting and I wanna make sure, you know, everybody is getting to contribute all of that, I can tell you, with certainty, I'm the worst note taker. So you do not want me to, to do that. And if I'm talking a lot, I always have to assign somebody else to do the notes because I know I'll do a terrible job. So just if you're like me, then just call yourself out and make sure that you have somebody there. Um, and then whoever is taking the notes, please do not try to be a court stenographer. Um, gosh, I see this still where it's just like, tries, people try to like script every single utterance of the conference, even things that really like do not matter at all. And then also like miss things or try to, or like assign the wrong person said this, I'll read it notes. And I'm like, I didn't say that, that was so-and-so. Um, so it does not have to be to that level of detail. You can really go the route of like a summary bullet point. So what was the topic discussed and sort of give the gist of the conversation and what the outcome was. And that will suffice in those notes. It doesn't have to be every single word uttered like in court. Um, another thing too with notes that drives me crazy is like we don't, we carry the notes through the IEP year, but then once we go back to that annual, we're starting fresh. Like you don't need to pull forward old notes for all of time. And then you end up with this 
you know, 75 page IEP that no one can even find the pertinent current information because it's all of this old stuff. So it's still part of the student record. It's still there. Um, but you, you know, you want to keep that clean um, just for the IEP year that you're in. And um, the thing I also do in Indiana IEP, I think the notes can get really confusing because it'll let you put notes at the bottom as you're in like creating the IEP throughout. But what I like to do is copy and paste all of them into the general box when you go into the conference note page, um, because then it lets you organize it so that it prints out in a way that makes sense so that you can put like your, you know, who was there, um, the date that it happened, especially if it's one where you've had multiple revisions and you can stack those and easily separate what notes happened when um, and just keep it really organized. Um, so that's always my preference is just that copy paste into the general notes section. Um, but I will say, um, I had uh, several years ago, I had a, a due process filed and there had been this really difficult conference that had just occurred. And um, I, I spoke to uh, someone who had been in the meeting and I was getting the full story of like everything that had happened and gone on and the conversation. So I pulled up the IEP um, expecting to see that. And there was like nothing in the notes, like nothing. Um, and so, I was like, what happened here? And sure enough, I, it didn't get in. So they had finalized and there wasn't anything in there. And so we ended up having to settle um, because we just didn't have the evidence um, to really push beyond that meeting. And although there were different versions of what happened at that meeting, I wasn't there. Um, the person from the state wasn't there, you know, so there wasn't anything written down. So just we can do the best job, um, but if we don't write it down, it, it doesn't matter. It didn't happen after the fact. Okay, so um, moving on to number 12, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, you know, and I... I will say this, like I always joke and say special education is a beast. Um, on the slide, I said it's complex, um, but you, you, it is impossible to know absolutely everything that there is to know in special education. Um, you know, and I think anyone who claims that they do is foolish, quite frankly, because there's always something new. There are changes happening, um, things occurring all the time. And so I know for myself, you know, I know enough to be dangerous about a lot of things, but I also am fully aware of what I don't know. And so I would encourage everyone, especially though younger teachers, like lean on the experts at the table, the therapists, the consultants, um, the veteran teachers, the administrators around you. Um, there are so many wonderful resources right there around the table, down the hall. You know, don't be afraid to lean in and ask questions. Um, it could be acronyms that are thrown around that you're like, I'm not sure I really understand that or medical information, um, you know, our, especially our OTs and our PTs have a great strong medical background and our SLPs as well. Like they have a lot of different background. Maybe if you're a certified teacher, you, you didn't have that training, you know, but, but there are people in your school who, who did and can help you, um, how to use equipment. You know, if you have a student who has physical therapy and there, um, there's some new equipment, you're, you're trying to help them get in and out of it, you know, just making sure that you're really tapping into these folks. They love their work and they want to help you. They want to build capacity with you and share their knowledge because the thing I know about our therapists they're spread so thin all the time. They're everywhere. So um, I know that they love to see when the things that they have taught are happening when they're not there. It's almost like they're cloning themselves across our districts, which is wonderful. Um, so just make sure that, you know, you're just like a sponge. Um, I remember when I was first teaching, I just was blessed to have some incredible people working with me, um, some that I still work with today. And I had the chance, you know, I'm like, let's go teach this lesson. Let's, you know, do this group together. And, and it was just 
awesome because it was stuff that I had not been taught in college and I had knew nothing about, but when I could follow what they were doing and they could show me, then I could continue that work with our student. And we saw more growth because the student was able to utilize the strategy, utilize the equipment, you know, or whatever it was that they were working on. And it really does give an opportunity to see that incredible growth. Um, what we don't want you to do is that whole notion of fake it till you make it like this isn't the time for that. It's fine. Ask. We would rather you ask, ask the question, learn. Um, and then the next kid that you have that has something similar, you're already going to know what you're doing. And, you know, that's just how you get experience over time. Um, what we don't want is for you to be embarrassed to ask or feel like it's, you know, like you should know. So you shouldn't ask the question and then make a mistake because you didn't know, like just ask the question and everyone wants to help and, and support. So the next one um, that I put as number 13 is your words and how you say them matter. This is so important. Um, and, you know, I think whenever we're talking and addressing really anyone, um, but especially I'm thinking about um, with our parents, um, thinking about what we say and how we say it, thinking about our tone our body language, sometimes it might not be what we say, but the way that we're standing or the look on our face. Um, and it's not that we just want to have, you know, rose colored glasses and never go over things that we're concerned about or have hard conversations. But when we do have the hard conversations, there is just, there's a way to do so with grace and kindness. Um, you also want to be sure that you're at baseline before trying to handle a difficult situation. Um, so like I mentioned that too, with the response, like sometimes you get an email and, you know, I, I sometimes take my time on that too. Just like I talked about taking the time to finalize an IEP. If I'm not sure that my response is going to be what it needs to be, then I need to take a breath and take a minute and make sure I'm at baseline. Um, because I don't get a redo on the way that I say things. Um, and then too, just thinking about your own biases and your blind spots when you're framing a conversation. Um, so we, um, in our office, have been using this wheel. Um, Todd Hawks is the, our, one of our assistant directors here at Wayne and he found this in an article recently and we love it. So we've been using it on everything, but I think it's such a beautiful picture of what I'm trying to articulate here. Like just being aware of this wheel of power and privilege and, and where different pieces fall. So knowing who you're speaking with, but then realizing that they may feel they may be uh, marginalized in a different area and understanding um, just what sort of power just as school people that we hold at times um, and really thinking through how they may feel um, having these conversations. So just, I think it's always something that I know for me personally, I'm always working to be kind, be gracious, um, to remember even in tough situations, sometimes parents are embarrassed by what occurred and, and they might come at you in a really um, challenging way, but it might be just the embarrassment showing through. Um, and I think it, you get better with time and it takes practice, but um, you just want to really think about how to have those hard conversations. 14, um, parents are the most important people at the table. Uh, this book, uh, From Disability to Possibility by Patrick Schwartz is one of my favorite books that I ever read in my career. And I think it was really, um, honestly, a game changer for me. I read this when I was a very young director. And there's a, key, a chapter called Parents are the Gold Standard. And it really changed my approach. I think I, I just wasn't doing a good enough job always of truly understanding that parents, um, their voice has to have space at the table. Like they are truly the most important people at the table. They're the child's first teacher. We have to work to get their input and their feedback. Um, and then the other piece of this too, is that parents know their own child's shortcomings. You know, I can tell you, um, every, every shortcoming of Hayden and Trace, that's for sure. <clears throat> and so, you know, you don't need to, to tell me, like, I know better than anyone, um, but I also know just how wonderful they are, you know, and, and all of their strengths. And so I think it does a whole lot at a conference table when you start with strengths and you point out some things that you really love about the child that you're discussing. It helps put the parent at ease because who doesn't love to talk about how wonderful the child is or, or just something that they're really good at that you've noticed, something they've grown in. Um, they don't, it, it's just challenging. If you start a meeting off on a negative note, you're probably going to end on a negative note too. 
And then just listening, really listening in meetings. Um, I have jokingly been called the parent whisperer before, but it's not, there's no magic to anything that I ever do with parents. It's just that I listen and I really try to understand and have empathy. And I try to get underneath what the conversation is about and try to help find solutions. And sometimes it's not even about the solutions. They just needed someone to hear them. And, and that's really all it takes. Um, so then just thinking about how you aren't always responding to their comment or formulating what, what is the next thing you're going to say, but instead sitting in what they are saying to you and really processing what they're saying to you. Um, and then too, when we have a million people around the conference table, all those experts I was talking about before, and they're going on and on and on and they're great and that's wonderful, but like making sure that there is intentional time where there's a pause to check in with the parent. There's um, you know an opportunity like to, to ask the parent to, what do they think or what is their input or do they have any thoughts about that? So um, they might not want to be rude or interrupt or just feel like they don't really have a chance to get in there. So just being sure that you're super intentional, I think goes a long way. 15, um, parents who trust you typically don't sue. Now, remember, I didn't go to law school, so this isn't a guarantee, but practice is um, when you build that trust, you usually are in much better footing with parents. And so another book that I think is great that's been around a while is The Speed of Trust. Um, and this is just about taking the time to, to build a relationship because it saves you so much time down the road. So once someone trusts you, um, you're much more efficient. You know, you're able to get things done. You both have that mutual respect and the ability to get work done, like in the quote. Um, you know, it's trust that transforms a group of people into a team. And that's what you want to be at a case conference table as a team. When you're sitting in those meetings that are extremely tedious and lengthy, they do not trust you. I had one a couple years ago that we reconvened, I think, three different times. There was a due process that had been filed. There was a re-eval review that had to happen, including an FBA. I mean, there were just like so many things. And I think we logged a total of seven hours total of conference time there was zero trust on that team. And that was something that, you know, coming in as director, I had to really help support and build because that's a non-example of how you want a meeting to go. Um, but when you get into that, you get into that gotcha back and forth, it just wastes everyone's time and effort. So we just want to be open, transparent, work together, be a team. Um, and then our, we're going to be much more efficient when we do that. Um, 16, anyone can file a complaint with the, with the Indiana Department of Education. So this is something I did not know until um, this happened to me. So we had a, a really unusual situation and we were trying to support um, really and had con some concerns that someone had a student um, living with her that we really didn't feel like she should have. Um, we, we really had some major concerns that we were reporting, in fact, but um, in the meantime, she got upset with the school and the school wasn't responding in a timely manner on a couple things. And so she filed a complaint. And so I was like, explain to the complaint investigator, you know, hey, I, this is what's going on. Like we have all these concerns. It doesn't matter. They still had to open an investigation and we had some findings. So um, you just have to be aware, you know, even if it's an extended family member, it could be someone close to the situation, but not in it advocates, even your own school staff can file complaints, anyone can, and then the department has to investigate, even if it's unusual. So just always be mindful and then think about like just remembering your confidentiality and, you know, what's appropriate to share and what is not. 17 is if something feels off, speak up. So I think, you know, often uh, trusting your instincts is, is the way to go. So I'm not talking about mandatory reporting situations like you have a legal obligation always if there's something where you suspect, um, you know, that you need to report to Child Protective Services like you have to report the law. So um, that's not what I'm talking about. But sometimes something just seems amiss with a situation or um, maybe something's happening with a colleague that you feel like they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, or you're concerned about something in your school, the service is not happening, inclusive practice is not happening, maybe it's an equity issue that you've identified. Um, instead of just sitting back and waiting for someone else to address it, I would just always say, um, speak up. Like if it feels off to you, it probably is, you know? So um, another thing that happens sometimes is that building leaders give different direct directives than we do in at the district level for special education. So, and we don't always know that we don't match up. So sometimes it takes 
a teacher or a service provider or therapist to speak up and say like, hey, just heads up, like you guys are not giving the same directive on this. Um, but really lean in um, and ask for help if you're unsure how to navigate a situation. I know there have been times where I've had teachers come to me and they're like, I know that you told us to do this, but my principal said do this. So we still need to know, like, you need to speak up because at the end of the day, you need to do the right thing, but we'll help navigate and have those conversations and support both sides and, you know, handle it in a way that is gracious to everyone involved. But what we can't do is just not want to offend anybody and then not do the right thing for kids. So um, always err on the side of kids. And then the last lesson, number 18, is your director's job is to support you. So um, depending on what your role is, you might not really know what we do. And so as directors, I always say this too, when we are doing our jobs well, the rest of the department and the district has no idea what we actually do. That's a good thing. Like you don't want to know what we're doing a lot of the time. Um, and sometimes principals give me a hard time. Like I've seen you a lot lately. You're great, but that's usually not good. So um, sometimes I end up coming to the things that aren't going super well, um, but we're there. Like that is our job is to offer support and guidance. So wherever you are, whatever district you're working in, just make sure that you know who your director is, um, that you know how to access the support. Um, I just wanted to put a plug in for my colleagues because I know how hard um, the special ed directors are working across the state. Um, and so I just wanted you to know that we are here to support you. And I know that your director would feel the exact same way. Um, just remember, like when it comes to challenging situations with students and families, we want to know early. Um, we can often intervene, you know, when we know it at the beginning instead of just getting something filed and landing on our desks. Um, I know sometimes too, I would say I've got broad shoulders. I can be the bad guy. Sometimes I want to come in and, and give the message so that the school team doesn't have to, um, or just, you know, support in different ways. So, so just remember that you do have support at all levels in whatever organization you're working in. And then most importantly, just remember why you started. So with all of this, like I said, it's always a work in progress. I think I learned something every single day at work and I wouldn't have it any other way. That's why you know, this is my 21st year and I still, like I said at the beginning, I still love this work. I, um, I wouldn't want to do anything else. And so, um, but the reason is because I'm able to reflect and keep my why and, and understand, you know, just that we, maybe we don't fix everything in a day. We don't, fix, I don't, not maybe, we don't fix everything in a day. It's very challenging work, but we fix something every day and we make things better and we support a whole lot of kids and families. And I think that's just work to be really proud of. So with that, um, we have, I think, nine more minutes for questions. So I don't know um, if there are any questions. I also wanted to say my contact information is here. So if there are any follow-up questions later, things that you think of, or just things that we could partner with you on um, from Wayne, we're happy to do that. My email is there. Um, and then also my um, Twitter handle too. So we try to be pretty active on Twitter or X, whatever it's called now here. Thank you, Dr. Watkins, for your time and your expertise. We do have a question um, in the question and answer. And that question is, at what age or grade have you found including the student in her or his own conference to share strengths, needs, and input for supports uh, and goals? You know, I think it depends on the level of the student, but, um, and then also just how much parents have talked with their students. But I've seen even um, in elementary, I think even before the student is a required invite, it can be really effective to have them at the table, even if it's just for a portion of the meeting. Um, I also can think of, I had a family that I love what they did. They would work with their child ahead of the conference and sort of come up with what he wanted to present to the team. And so we would have him come in at the beginning and he would share like his concerns and we would talk through those first. And then he was like, I got to go to gym class or whatever it was that he was missing and would go back. And then we would finish the remainder of the meeting. But I want to say that was even as young as like second, third grade, but he was comfortable doing that and wanted to. So it just depends on the student and the family. But as soon as they feel prepared and ready, I think it's great to bring the student in so they don't feel like things are happening to them, but they're part of the conversation and the decision. And then I also think that sets them up for down the road because it's never too early to start planning for post-secondary. So then there does come a point where, you know, um, 
the school is no longer responsible for all of the accommodations and all the things happening. So, I mean, I'm going as far as like, okay, let's say this kid is going to college someday. Like they need to be prepared to self-advocate and, and know, you know, about their disability, what their accommodations are and that sort of thing. And as soon as you can start that conversation, I think that's really helpful. Another question is what the name of the book was on the slide about speed of trust. Um, yeah, it's called, let me go back to it. It's called The Speed of Trust and it's Stephen M. R. Covey. So I, I believe he's the son of the highly, the seven habits of highly effective people that author. I think this is his son, but it's called The Speed of Trust. The one thing that changes everything. And we did have a request um, if you'd be willing to share uh, your slide deck with staff. I would assume that it would be okay for them to reach out to you via yeah, your email. Yeah, I thought that Todd had uploaded it, but maybe not. I didn't have the access to be able to do it, but yeah, I'm happy to share. Okay. And then just a reminder too that this will be available um, as a recording. So you will be able to go back and view the recording and um, get the resources that are available there. I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware as well before you leave today that I did put the link um, for the PGP points in the chat. So be sure that you are heading there to make sure you fill that out before the end of the day today. I don't believe that we have any additional questions. So I wanna thank Dr. Watkins again for her time and expertise and thank all of you for joining us and hope you enjoy the rest of your time with the Breaking Down Barriers Fall Symposium today. Thanks, everybody.